Chapter Thirteen of Edmund Dulick's Fairy Tale Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Edmund Dulick's Fairy Tale Book by Edmund Dulick. Urashimo taro a very long time ago there lived in japan a young fisherman named urashima taro his father before him had been a very expert fisherman but urashima's skill in the art so far exceeded that of his father that his name as a fisher was known far and wide beyond his own little village it was a common saying that he could catch more fish in a day than a dozen others could in a whole week but it was not only as a fisher that urishima excelled wherever he was known he was loved for his kindly heart never had he hurt even the meanest creature indeed it had not been necessary to catch fish for his living he would always have fished with a straight hook so as to catch only such fish as wished to be caught and as for teasing and tormenting animals when he was a boy his tenderness towards all the dumb creation was a matter for laughter with his companions but nothing would ever induce him to join in the cruel sport in which some boys delight one evening as urashima was returning from a hard day's fishing he met a number of boys all shouting and laughing over something they were worrying in the middle of the road it was a tortoise they had caught and were ill-treating between them all what with sticks and stones and other kinds of torture the poor creature was hard beset and seemed almost frightened to death Urashima could not bear to see a helpless thing treated in that way, so he interfered. Boys, he said, that's no way to treat a harmless dumb creature. You'll kill the poor thing. But the boys merely laughed, and taking no further notice, continued their cruel sport. What's a tortoise? cried one. Besides, it's great fun. Come on, lads and they went on with their heartless game urashima thought the matter over for a little wondering how he could persuade the boys to give the tortoise up to him at last he said with a smile come boys i know you're good-hearted young fellows i'll make a bargain with you what i really wanted was to buy the tortoise that is if it is your own of course it's our own we caught it they had begun to gather round him at the prospect of a sale for they relished the money to buy sweet meats even more than the cruel sport of tormenting an innocent creature very well replied urishima bringing a string of coins out of his pocket and holding them up see you can buy a lot of nice things with this what do you say he smiled at them so sweetly and spoke so gently that with the cash dangling before their eyes they were soon won over the biggest boy then grabbed the tortoise and held it out to him with one hand while he reached for the string of coins with the other all right uncle he said you can have the tortoise Urashima handed over the money in exchange for the poor frightened creature and the boys were soon making their way to the nearest sweetmeat shop meanwhile Urashima looked at the tortoise which looked back at him with wistful eyes full of meaning and though it could not speak the young fisherman understood it perfectly and his tender heart went out to it poor little tortoise he said holding it up and stroking it gently to soothe its fears you are all right with me but remember sweet little one you've had a narrow squeak of losing a very long life how long is it 
ten thousand years, they say. That's ten times as long as a stork can boast of. Now I'm going to take you right back to the sea so that you can swim away to your home and to your own people. But promise me you'll never let yourself be caught again. The tortoise promised with his eyes. So wistful and grateful were they that Urashima felt he could never forget them. By this time he was down on the seashore, and there he placed the tortoise in the sea and watched it swim away. Then he went home feeling very happy about the whole thing. Morning was breaking when Urashima pushed off his boat for his day's fishing. The sea was calm, and the air was full of the soft, sweet warmth of summer. Soon he was out skimming over the blue depths, and when the tide began to ebb, he drifted far beyond the other fishermen's boats, until his own was lost to their sight. It was such a lovely morning when the sun rose and slanted across the waters, that, when he thought of the short span of human life, he wished that he had thousands of years to live like the tortoise he had rescued from the boys the day before as he was dreaming these thoughts he was suddenly startled by a sweet voice calling his name it fell on his ears like the note of a silver bell dropping from the skies again it came nearer than before urashima urashima he looked all around on the surface of the sea thinking that some one had hailed him from a boat but there was no one there as far as the eye could reach and now he heard the voice again close at hand and looking over the side of the boat he saw a tortoise looking up at him and he knew by its eyes it was the same tortoise he had restored to the sea the previous day so we meet again he said pleasantly fancy you finding me in the middle of the ocean what is it you funny little tortoise did you want to be caught again eh i have looked for you replied the tortoise ever since dawn and when i saw you in the boat i swam after you to thank you for saving my life well that's very nice of you to say that i haven't much to offer you but if you would like to come up into the boat and dry your back in the sun we can have a chat the tortoise was pleased to accept the invitation and urashima helped it over the side then after talking of many things the tortoise remarked i suppose you have never seen rim jin the dragon sea king's palace have you urashima shook his head no he replied they tell me it is a beautiful sight but in all the years that i have spent upon the sea i have never been invited to the dragon king's palace it is some distance from here isn't it i do not think you believe there is such a place replied the tortoise who had seen a twinkle in urashima's eye yet i assure you it exists but a long way off right down at the bottom of the sea if you would really like to see rin jin i will take you there that is very kind of you said urashima with a polite bow which pleased the tortoise greatly but i am only a man you know and cannot swim a long way under the sea like a tortoise but the little creature hastened to reassure him that is not at all necessary it said i'll do the swimming and you can ride on my back urashima laughed the idea of his riding on the back of a tortoise that he could hold in his hand was funny and he said so never mind how funny it is said the tortoise just get on and see and then as urashima looked at it the tortoise grew and grew and grew until its back was big enough for two men to ride upon what an extraordinary thing exclaimed urashima right you are friend tortoise i'll come with you and with that he jumped on that's better said the tortoise 
now we'll be off hold tight the next moment the tortoise plunged into the sea and dived down and down until rashima thought they would never be able to reach the surface again in a thousand years at last he caught sight of a land below them shining all green with the filtered sunlight and now as they took a level course he could make out the towns and villages below with beautiful gardens full of bright flowers and waving dreamy trees then they passed over a vast green plain at the further side of which in a village at the foot of high mountains shone the splendid portals of a magnificent palace see said the tortoise that is the entrance to rin jin we shall soon be there now how do you feel quite well thank you and indeed when urashima felt his clothes he found they were quite dry which was really not so surprising because as he was borne swiftly through the water there was all the time a space of air around him so that not only was he quite kept quite dry but he could breathe quite easily when they drew nearer to the great gate urashima could see beyond it half hidden by the trees the shining domes of the palace it was indeed a magnificent place unlike anything ever seen in the lands above the sea now they were at the great gate and the tortoise stopped at the foot of a flight of coral steps and asked him to dismount you can walk now urashima and it led the way then the gatekeeper a royal sturgeon challenged them but the tortoise explained that urashima was a mortal from the great kingdom of japan who had come to visit the sea king and the gatekeeper immediately showed them in as they advanced they were met by the courtiers and officials the dolphin the bonito the great cuttlefish the bright red bream and the mullet the sole the flounder and a host of other fishes came forward and bowed gracefully before the tortoise indeed such homage did they pay that urashima wondered what sway the tortoise held in this kingdom beneath the sea then when the visitor was introduced they all cried out a welcome and the dolphin who was a high official remarked we are all delighted to see so distinguished a stranger from the great kingdom of japan welcome to the palace of the dragon king of the sea then all the fishes went in a procession before them to the interior of the palace now the humble fishermen had never been in such a magnificent place before he had never read how to behave in a palace but through much amazed he did not feel at all shy as he followed his guides he suddenly noticed that the tortoise had disappeared but he soon forgot this when he saw a lovely princess surrounded by her maidens come forward to greet him she was more beautiful than anything on earth and her robes of pink and green changed color like the surface of the sea at sunset in some sheltered cove there were threads of pure gold in her long hair and as she smiled her teeth looked like little white pearls she spoke soft words to him and her voice was as the murmur of the sea urashima was so enchanted that he could not speak a word but he had heard that one must always bow low to a princess and he was about to do so when the princess tripped to his side and taking his hand in hers led him off into a splendid apartment where she conducted him to the place of honor and asked him to be seated listen to me urashima she said in a low sweet voice i am filled with joy at welcoming you to my father's palace and i will tell you why 
yesterday you saved the precious life of a tortoise urashima i was that tortoise it was my life that you saved urashima could not believe this at first but when he gazed into her beautiful eyes he remembered their wistful look and her sweet words were spoken in the same voice as that which had called his name upon the sea and he was so astonished that he could not speak would you like to live here always urashima to live in everlasting youth never growing tired or weary this is the land of eternal summer where all is joy and neither death nor sorrow may come stay urashima and i the princess of my father's kingdom will be your bride urashima felt it was all a dream yet if it were then from the very heart of that dream he replied in words that came of their own accord sweet princess if i could thank you ten thousand times i should still want to thank you all over again i will stay here nay more i simply cannot go for this is the most wonderful place i have ever dreamed of and you are the most wonderful thing in it a smile spread over her lovely face she bent towards him and their lips met in the first sweet kiss of love then as if by this a magic button had been pressed a loud gong sounded and immediately the whole palace was in a bustle of excitement presently a procession of all kinds of fishes came in all richly attired in flowing robes of various colors each one advanced with slow and stately place some bearing beautiful flowers others great mother-of-pearl dishes laden with all the delicacies that go to make a feast others bore trays of coral red and white with fragrant wines and rare fruits such as only grow at the bottom of the sea it was the wedding feast and with all decorum they set everything before the bride and bridegroom it was a day of great joy a day of song and revelry throughout the whole kingdom the choice wine flowed and the sweet music resounded in the palace the happy pair pledged themselves in a wedding cup while the music played and glad songs were sung later on the great hall of the palace was cleared for a grand ball and all the fishes of the sea came dressed in their best gold and silver scales and danced till the small hours never had urishima known happiness so great never had he moved amid so much splendor in the morning the princess showed urashima over the palace and pointed out all the wonders it contained the whole palace was fashioned out of pink and white coral beautifully carved and inlaid everywhere with priceless pearls but wonderful as was the palace itself the wide gardens that encircled it appealed to urashima even more these gardens were designed so as to represent the four seasons turning to the east urashima beheld all the wealth of spring butterflies flitted from flower to flower and bees were busy among the cherry blossoms the song of the nightingale could be heard among the trees and the sweetest fragrance was wafted on the breeze facing round to the south he saw everything at the height of summer the trees were fully green and luscious fruits weighed down their branches while over all was the drowsy hum of the cicadia to the west the whole landscape was ablaze with the scarlet foliage of autumn while in the north the whole outlook was beautiful with snow as far as the eye could reach it was a wonderful country to live in and never grow old no wonder that urashima forgot his home in japan forgot his old parents 
forgot even his own name but after three days of indescribable happiness he seemed to wake up to a memory of who he was and what he had been the thought of his poor old father and mother searching everywhere for him perhaps mourning him as dead the surroundings of his simple home his friends in the little village all these things rushed in on his mind and turned all his joy to sadness alas he cried how can i stay here any longer my mother will be weeping and wringing her hands and my father bowing his old head in grief i must go back this very day so towards evening he sought the princess his bride and said sadly alas alas you have been so kind to me and i have been so very very happy that i have forgotten and neglected my parents for three whole days they will think i am dead and will weep for me i must say farewell and leave you then the princess wept and besought him to remain with her beloved he protested in our land of japan there is no crime so terrible as the crime of faithlessness to one's parents i cannot face that and you would not have me do it yet it will break my heart to leave you break my heart break my heart i must go beloved but only for one day then i will return to you alas cried the princess what can we do you must act as your heart guides you i would give the whole world to keep you with me just one more day but i know it cannot be i know something of your land and your love of your parents i will await your return you will be gone only one day it will be a long day for me but when it is over and you have told your parents all you will find a tortoise waiting for you by the seashore and you will know that tortoise it is the same that will take you back to your parents for one day oh my beloved how can i leave you but but you must wait i have something to give you before you go the princess left him hastily and soon returned with a golden casket set with pearls and tied about with a green ribbon made from the floating seaweed take it said she after all your other gifts said he feeling rather ashamed you saved my life said she you are my life and all i have is yours that casket contains all when you go up to the dry land you must always have this box with you but you must never open it till you return to me if you do alas alas for you and me i promise i promise i will never open it till i return to you urashima went on his bended knee as he said these words farewell farewell urashima was then conducted to the gate by the court officials led by the dolphin then the royal sturgeon blew a loud whistle and presently a large tortoise came up and urashima mounted on its back it adverted its head as if to conceal its eyes perhaps it had a reason and for that same identical reason urashima sat on its back solidly and never a word spoken down they went into the deep green sea and then up into the blue for miles and miles and miles they sped along until they came to the coast of japan there urashima stepped ashore answered the wistful eyes of the tortoise with the long lingering gaze of love and hastened inland the tortoise plunged back into the sea and urashima was left on the land with a sense of sadness he looked about him recognizing the old landmarks then he went up into the village but as he went 
he noticed with some surprise that everything seemed wonderfully changed the hills were the same and in a way the village was familiar but the people who passed him on the road were not those he had known three days ago surely three short days would leave him exactly where he stood before he went three days could never produce this change he was at a loss to understand it people he did not know strangers in the village he supposed passed him by as if he were a complete stranger some of them turned and looked at him as one would look at a newcomer furthermore he noticed that the slender trees of three days since were now giant monarchs of the wayside at last wondering greatly he came to his old home how changed it was and when he turned the handle of the door and walked in crying out ho oh, mother ho oh, father i have come back at last he was met by a strange man barring the doorway what do you want what do you mean i live here where are my father and mother they are expecting me i do not understand what is your name urashima taro urashima taro cried the man in surprise yes that is my name urashima taro the man laughed as if he saw the joke you don't mean the original urashima taro he said but still you may be some descendant of his what i do not understand you my name is urashima taro there is no other bears that name i am the fisherman surely you know me the man looked at urashima very closely to see if he were joking or not there was a urashima taro a famous fisherman of three hundred years ago but you you are joking nay nay i am not joking it is you that are joking with your three hundred years i left here three or four days ago and now i have returned where have my father and mother gone the man stared at him aghast are you mad he cried i have lived in this house for thirty years at least and as for your father and mother why if you are really urashima taro they have been dead three hundred years and that is absurd do you want me to believe you are a ghost not so look at my feet and urashima put out one foot then the other in full accordance with the japanese belief that ghosts have no feet well well said the man you can't be urashima taro whatever you say for he lived three hundred years ago and you are not yet thirty with this the man banged the door in urashima's face what could it all mean urashima taro dead lived three hundred years ago what nonsense he must be dreaming he pinched his ear and assured himself that he was not only alive but wide awake and yet and yet everything about him seemed very much changed since he saw it last he stood stock still on his way to the gate and looked this way and that trying to find something that had suffered only three days change but everything was unfamiliar then an idea struck him on the morning of the day that he had rescued the tortoise from the boys he had planted a little willow slip down by the pond in the field he would go and look at it and that would settle the matter so he took his way to the pond halfway he was balked by a hedge high and thick which was new to him but he found a way through a gap while well, he remembered the exact spot where he had planted the willow slip on the edge of the pond but when he arrived there he could see no sign of it in its place was a gigantic trunk bearing vast branches which towered overhead 
and there the birds were singing the same songs as they sang three days ago alas could it indeed be three centuries ago perplexed beyond measure urashima resolved to go to the fountain head and settle the matter once and for all turning away he made all haste to the village was this the village he had known and inquired of a countryman he had never seen before where the village chronicles were kept yonder said the man pointing to a building which had certainly taken more than three days to erect urashima thanked him and then hastened to the building and went in he was not long in finding what he wanted it was an ancient entry and it ran urashima taro a famous fisherman who lived in the early part of the fourteenth century the traditional patron demigod of fishermen there are many stories concerning this half mythical character chief of which is that he hooked a whale far from shore and as he would not relinquish the prize his boat was dragged for ever and ever over the surface of the sea mariners of the present day solemnly aver that they have seen urashima taro sitting in his boat skimming the waves as he held the line by which he had caught the whale whatever the real history of urashima taro it is certain that he lived in the village and the legend concerning him is the subject of great interest to visitors from the great land of america urashima shut the book with a slam and went away down to the seashore as he went he realized that those three days he had spent in perfect happiness with the princess were not three days at all but three hundred years his parents were long since dead and all was changed what else could he do but go back to the dragon kingdom under the sea but when he reached the shore he found no tortoise ready to take him back and after waiting a long time he began to think his case was hopeless then suddenly he bethought himself of the little box which the princess had given him he drew it forth and looked at it he had promised her not to open it but what did it matter now as he did not care what happened to him the deadly secret of the box was just as well out as in besides he might learn something from it some secret way of finding his beloved princess and that would be happiness but if on the other hand some terrible thing happened to him what did it signify so he sat down on the seashore untied the fastenings of the little box and then lifted the lid he was surprised to find that the box was empty but slowly out of the emptiness came a little thin purple cloud which curled up and circled about his head it was fragrant and reminded him of the sweet perfume of the princess's robes now it floated away towards the open sea and urashima's soul seemed to go with it suddenly he stood up thinking he heard her sweet voice calling him for a moment he stood there a splendid figure of early youth then a change came over him his eyes grew dim his hair turned silvery white lines came upon his face and his form seemed to shrivel with extreme old age then urashima taro reeled and staggered to and fro the burden of three hundred years was too heavy for him he threw up his arms and fell dead upon the sand end of chapter thirteen Chapter Fourteen of Edmund Dulac's Fairy Tale Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Edmund Dulock's Fairy Tale Book by Edmund Dulock. Chapter 14 The Firebird, a Russian Fairy Tale. It was a great day when the prince was born. The king was delighted, and the queen nearly went mad with joy. The courtiers, though they hardly dared dance a trepak in the palace, could not keep their heels still, while the guards, the attendants, the little pages and pretty kitchen maids drank tea and coffee, glass after glass, till the following morning, when they all had supper, and then crept off on tiptoe to bed. The people clapped their hands and sang and danced in the squares and streets, till those who danced the longest got sore throats, and those who sang the loudest got footsore. The whole city could not sleep for joy. The young prince was the firstborn and would one day sit upon the throne. Was this a thing to put under the pillow? On with the dance, another song, drink deep to the young prince. The doctors smiled and stroked the smile down to the tips of their grey beards as they nodded to one another amiably. The child was strong and healthy and would live, and besides they all agreed upon the point that he was a prince and had his father's nose. But alas, doctors are not everybody. After the revel a wise man from Persia who was staying in the city at the time awoke from his slumbers and dressed himself and went to see the king. Sunk in a deep sleep he had missed the celebrations, but he had found a vision of the future, and he was now hastening to see the king about it, for, as you must understand, when a wise man knows the worst he can never keep it to himself. When he came before the king he had scarcely the heart to tell him what would befall his firstborn. But the king bade him speak out, and he obeyed. Sire, he said humbly, I come not to tell thee bad news, but rather to warn thee in time lest a vision that came to me in the night should perchance come true. The king looked a little anxious, for he had heard tales, strange but true, about this wise man from Persia and his wonderful powers. Speak on, Ferdasan, he said. Sire, replied the seer, the dream that came to me was a deep sleep vision. Doubt not that it is a warning entrusted to me to lay before you, O king. This is the substance of it. Fifteen years came and went before my inner eyes, and the sun that has been born to you from heaven grew more beautiful year by year. But at the close of the fifteenth year he flew away. Flew away, cried the king, startled, and what was the manner of his flight, O Ferdasan? Sire, in the midst of the palace gardens, Hauser the bird of the sun came to seek him, or to be sought by him. He mounted on the back of this bird, and then, as the twilight fell, it carried him away westward. With what purpose, Ferdasan? That, sire, I can reveal to you only in words that hide my thoughts, and nay, nay, tell me all, I command you. His fate stands thus. He is destined to marry the Maiden of the Dawn, and, in quest of her, he will fly westward in his fifteenth year unless. Yes? Unless what, man? Unless you yourself, sire, keep watch and ward, and so prevent him. The king stared at the seer. How could he believe this thing? It seems that you have come to disturb my peace, he said angrily. What proof have I that you speak truly? If your wisdom has brought me this warning, then your wisdom can avert the evil fate. You will remain in this palace until the die is cast. That is my command. Sire, replied Ferdasan humbly, my work is done, and I must return to my cave in the mountains. What? cried the king in a rage. You defy me? I will compel you. You cannot, replied Ferdasan. See your stand before kings, and that is true in two ways. We shall see. The king clapped his hands fiercely. Then as two guards came running in answer to the summons, he cried, Take that man and place him in a dungeon. The guards turned upon Ferdasan, who stood calm and unmoved, looking at the king. Then, as they were about to seize him, a strange thing happened. They clutched at the empty air and staggered against one another, amazed. For a moment the throne room seemed to echo a sweet music from far away. For a moment it was filled with the faint fragrance of mountain lilies. Then the king saw a thin gray mist slowly issuing through one of the windows to dissolve in the sunlight. And then he knew. From that time forward the king regarded the seer's prediction with great anxiety. He watched the young prince continually in his first years, and when, as was often the case, he saw him gazing wistfully towards the west when the sun had set, he felt sure that the coming event had cast its shadow before. 
Accordingly, as soon as the young prince entered his fifteenth year, the king had him imprisoned in a lofty tower situated in the palace gardens, and placed a guard about it, for he was determined to take no risk whatever. But while he kept the prince a close prisoner, he surrounded him with every luxury, for he loved him dearly. He even promised him that on his fifteenth birthday a great festival would be held in his honour, though he himself would only be allowed to watch the festivities from the high window of the tower. The prince implored his father to let him wander in the gardens on his birthday. But the king was so afraid that, by some means or other, he would be spirited away, that he refused. In addition to this, he double-locked and barred the topmost room of the tower in which the prince was imprisoned. On the day of the festival the sun rose bright. As the prince watched it from his high window, his heart rose with it. At noon he had fully decided to disobey his father and escape from his prison. He brooded till sunset. Then, as the twilight gathered, he went to the window again and listened to the sounds of festivity in the city all around. Presently he leaned out over the window sill and looked down. It was a long way to the ground, but the gardens were beautiful, and he was determined to reach them and roam free among the trees and flowers. Was not this his birthday? And was not the city holding high festival in his honour? It seemed hard that he should be a prisoner when even the guards of his prison had stolen away to join the merry throng. The city without was a blaze of light and a chorus of revel, but the gardens below seemed to be deserted. Now was his opportunity. Turning back into the apartment he swept his eyes round for anything that would serve as a rope. There were heavy hangings falling from the high ceiling. He could not pull these down. There was the carpet. Yes he could make a rope of that. He quickly secured a knife and ripped from the edge of the carpet many long threads. When he had a sufficient number he set to work to plait a rope, splicing fresh threads in at intervals until it was nearly a hundred feet long. Then he tied one end of it securely to one of the pillars supporting the roof, and let the free length of it down from the window. By the light of the full moon sailing overhead he could see that the end of the rope reached as far as the branches of a tree growing at the foot of the tower. It was now past midnight, and the garden below was just as silent as the city outside was loud with merriment. As the prince climbed over the window sill and let himself down the rope, he took no thought as to how he might get back again. It was quite enough to get away from the lonely, stifling place of his imprisonment. At last his feet touched the topmost bough of the tree, but there was rope to spare, and he went on until at the end of it he was able to grasp a bough thick enough to bear his weight and by this means he climbed along to the trunk and so to the ground. There was no one about. The guards were all away merry-making in the prince's honour. Although he was still a prisoner within the garden walls, he was enjoying his adventure and the sense of freedom to wander even in the gardens. He took his way along pathways where the moonbeams strayed. He drank in the cool night air and paused ever and again to pluck a sweet-smelling night-flower. Wandering on, he came at length to a bank at the end of the garden, beyond which he knew was a steep cliff overlooking a valley. Before his father had shut him up in the tower, he had always been forbidden to approach that end of the garden, and he had never done so. But now his curiosity led him on, and he advanced cautiously along an avenue of overarching trees. But it soon grew so dense and dark that he was about to turn back when suddenly he espied a misty light beginning to grow brighter and brighter at the far end of the avenue. Eager to find out where this light came from, and seeing his way more clearly now, he hastened on and soon arrived at the mouth of a large cave, which, inside, was as bright as day. He ventured farther forward and peered round a buttress of rock, and there, in the centre of the cave, a strange sight met his eyes. A gigantic bird was standing there, getting ready to fly through the farther opening overlooking the valley. It was stretching its neck and flapping its wings, and from every feather of these flashed rays and sparkles of light illuminating the whole place. In the centre of the cavern floor was a crystal pool, into which from a ledge high up on the wall fell a broad cascade, almost like a flowing veil, and the strong light shed by the giant bird shone through this onto the rock behind it. And there the prince saw the most beautiful thing he had ever set eyes on. It was an oval picture framed in crystal and hanging behind the transparent cascade a picture of a beautiful princess. And as he looked, 
her eyes met his. Immediately the young prince was filled with a great longing to find the original of this portrait, but it seemed that his only way of doing so was through the help of the great bird, which was now attracting his attention by strange signs. First it looked at him with a kindly eye, then it craned its neck towards the farther opening of the cave, and flapping its wings as if about to fly, ran a step or two and then stopped and looked back at him. After doing this two or three times it crouched down and turned its head sideways, looking straight at him as much to say, Don't you want to ride in the air? The prince saw the bird's meaning, but to signify that he wanted to find the princess he pointed to the picture. At this the bird spread its wings right out until the tips brushed against each side of the cave, the feathers quivering intensely and throwing out a bright light which almost blinded the prince. Then the bird drew in its wings and made a sign to him to mount between them. At this the prince, feeling sure that the giant bird meant to take him to the princess, climbed up and seated himself between the great wings. In another moment the bird had launched itself from the farther opening of the cave, and they were soon sailing high over the valley. Some revelers in the city looked up and saw what they took to be a meteor flashing across the sky. But it was really the fire-bird bearing the prince swiftly to the far-off palace of the princess. How many thousands of miles they flew between the darkest hour and dawn the prince could not tell. Nestling warm and comfortable among the soft feathers, he heard the roar of the great creature's wings, and knew they were traveling at a tremendous pace. And at last the firebird craned its neck downwards, and as they began to descend in a slanting direction, the prince could see something sparkling on the horizon in the first rosy light of dawn. Nearer and nearer they came, and now he could distinguish the great gates and towers of what seemed to be a palace of pure crystal surrounded by beautiful gardens. Swiftly they swooped downwards, and the firebird alighted on the edge of a broad balcony and crouched down for the prince to dismount. The journey had not been in vain. There on a mossy bank among the beautiful flowers in the garden he found the princess asleep, and as he looked down at her he saw that her face was the face he had seen in the portrait. He tried to wake her, but her sleep was sound. She did not stir. He breathed on her eyelids and whispered in her ear, but still she slept on. Seeing this, the bird grew restless, and craning its neck forward, seized the prince with its beak and placed him again between its wings. Then it sprang upwards and soared swiftly into the sky. Soon they were back in the cave, and the prince, dreading to return to the prison tower, spent the hours of daylight in his warm nest between the firebird's wings. The following night, as the hours were drawing on towards dawn, the bird set forth again. But again the prince was unable to wake the sleeping princess so they returned once more. But on the third night, when they reached the princess, the light of dawn was in the sky, and as it grew every moment rosier and rosier, the princess awoke of her own accord to find the young prince sitting among the flowers by her side. She had only just time to see the firebird pluck a feather from its wing with its beak, and let it fall at her feet before it soared away. She picked up the feather and placed it in her bosom. Then she looked at the prince. There is love, and there is love. But such love as sprang up at the same moment in two hearts can never be described. It was as if she had been dreaming about him all her life, and now she had awakened to find him. It was as if his journey had been to paradise. She raised her arms to him, and he enfolded her and kissed her. Then they wandered among the flowers and trees, and all the birds understood. They sang so divinely. Towards evening, as the shadows began to fall, the princess's sister, who was a wicked sorceress, came into the garden and stood behind a tree watching the lovers. I'll soon put an end to this, she said, clenching her hands in jealous rage. She went away and performed spells, and by her wicked arts she summoned the image of the prince before her, so that his life went out of his body, and he remained in the princess's arms like one dead. Terrified and distracted with grief, the princess carried the lifeless body of her lover into the palace and laid it on a couch in her own apartment. There, exhausted with the effort, she fell upon it, weeping bitterly. She called his name, but he did not answer. His ears were deaf, his eyes were closed, his pale lips did not respond to her kisses. But the prince was not dead. He was bewitched. 
The sorceress, by means of his image, had torn his heart from his breast and had taken it far away. Yet all the time that heart was still beating with life and with love for the princess. Forlorn and sorrowful, the princess sat by the couch when suddenly she started up with clenched hands. I know, I know, she cried. Then she bent down and kissed the prince's lips. She felt them tremble against hers, and though she could not call him back, she knew that he was not dead. Oh, my wicked sister, this is your work. You have bewitched my love. Never again. This is the end. She ran everywhere, in and about the palace, in search of her sister, her hands clenched, her eyes blazing, her teeth set. But she could not find her. At last a page, terrified to death at her aspect, confessed that her sister had fled from the palace alone, mounted on the fleetest steed of the stables. The princess at once resolved to follow her and force her to restore the prince to life and health. But at the very outset there was a terrible difficulty to be surmounted. The princess herself had never been beyond the walls that encircled the vast grounds of the palace. She knew that there were twelve gates, and that only one of these was left unlocked from sunset till sunrise, and that none could tell which one it might be. Now the law of the palace permitted her to try one gate each night, and one gate only. She sat down and thought, and then decided to try the same gate each night until it happened to be the right one. For twelve nights she tried, but each time she found the gate locked and barred. Then she suddenly remembered that, when the firebird had brought the prince to her, it had plucked a bright feather from its wings and let it fall at her feet. She had preserved it in a golden casket. Could it be that this feather had magic powers? She ran with all haste to her apartment and took it from the casket. As she did so it sparkled and quivered. As she held it up she was more than ever convinced that it held magic powers. She looked at the feather, and she thought of the firebird itself, and wished that it could only come and advise her what to do. Scarcely had she conceived the wish, when a faint sound from far away struck upon her ears. As she listened it grew louder, and louder, and nearer, and nearer, until at last she knew it was the roar of the firebird's wings. She ran out onto the balcony, and there she saw it, like a meteor in the sky, every moment growing bigger. At last, with a glad, shrill cry, it swooped down, and its giant wings fluttered and vibrated a moment before it alighted on the edge of the balcony, its fiery golden light sparkling on the crystal pillars and shimmering in the air all around. The princess held up the feather, and the firebird bowed its head slowly three times. Then it suddenly turned round as if to fly away, but looked back at her and raised its wings and fluffed out the soft, glistening feathers in the hollow of its back. Arching its head round, it began to act as if it were preparing a nest for her between its wings, and the princess saw plainly that it was only waiting for her to seat herself there before flying away. The bird knew what she wanted. She was sure of that. So she mounted between the wings and nestled down on a soft feather bed of dazzling golden light, warm and comfortable. Then with a long jubilant cry the bird rose in the air, and craning its neck westward flashed through space at a terrific rate. Very soon they overtook the setting sun, passed it and left it sinking on the horizon as they went on into the Perlaeus of the land of night and silence, which lies beyond the great round shoulder of the world. And here the firebird blazed along, leaving a trail of light in its wake and throwing a radiance on the hills and forest over which it passed, until it came by way of the valley which has no borders, to the forest without an end. Here the bird swooped downwards and alighted before a black-mouthed cave. He crouched while the princess dismounted. As she did so, the bird plucked two fresh feathers from its wing with its beak and held them out to her. They shed a brilliant light, and she, seeing at once that they would serve as lamps, took them one in each hand and advanced into the gloomy cave. She had not gone far when she heard a voice crooning a witch song, and peering round the edge of a rock, she espied her sister seated beside a cauldron, beneath which was a freezing fire fed with blocks of frozen brine. From the witch song her sister was singing, the princess learned that her lover's heart was in the cauldron. She listened while the sorceress sang, Seethe, seethe, heart of her lover, beating in tune with mine. Never the two their love can recover, 
never their arms entwine freeze freeze hard in this cauldron seared by the frozen brine with a scream the princess rushed forward and before her wicked sister could prevent her she had upset her cauldron with a crash some of the icy fire of brine splashed up in the face of the sorceress and with a loud grating shriek she fell to the ground senseless dead the princess snatched up her lover's heart and placed it in her bosom against her own where she could feel it still beating then without waiting another moment she ran back to the firebird and sprang upon its back with a cry of joy patting its neck and stroking its feathers up in the sky they soared again and away over the world towards the palace in the home of the dawn and as they neared their destination the princess suddenly missed something quickly she felt in her bosom to see if the heart of her lover was safe but lo it was gone it seemed to have grown warm and melted right away distressed at this she urged the firebird to still greater speed until his track through the sky was like that of a shooting star at length they swooped down and alighted on the balcony of the palace the roaring of the firebird's wings was stilled but the hum of its feathers continued a throbbing pulsation of musical sound as the princess alighted the prince himself came running to her then with a mingled cry of delight the lovers leapt to greet each other and when they were enfolded in each other's arms the firebird discreetly turned his head away and preened his tail feathers the princess did not trouble about her lover's heart which she had taken from the sorceress and missed on the way she now felt it beating against her own and knew that it was in its right place the prince was free from the wicked spell at last the firebird's work was done without a word he sprang into the air and was soon lost to sight and the lovers did not hear him go for by some mysterious power he hushed his wings and went secretly for as you must have seen he was really a very old bird the prince and the princess were married very soon and during the celebrations the firebird was seen to circle thrice every night round the palace but he never settled as king and queen of the people of the dawn they reigned for long years and the firebird was always their friend on every anniversary of their wedding day they awoke to the sound of his roaring wings he always brought a present and do you know what it was just a single feather of his shining wing so that they might obtain whatever joy they wished for end of chapter 14 recording by philip gould Chapter Fifteen of Edmund Dulac's Fairy Tale Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edmund Dulac's Fairy Tale Book by Edmund Dulac. Chapter Fifteen The Story of the Bird Fung, a Chinese Fairy Tale. In the book of the Ten Thousand Wonders there are three hundred and thirty-three stories about the bird called Fong, and this is one of them. Ta Kai, Prince of Tartary, dreamt one night that he saw in a place where he had never been before an enchantingly beautiful young maiden who could only be a princess. He fell desperately in love with her, but before he could either move or speak she had vanished. When he awoke he called for his ink and brushes and in the most accomplished willow-leaf style he drew her image on a piece of precious silk, and in one corner he wrote these lines. The flowers of the peony, will they ever bloom? A day without her is like a hundred years. He then summoned his ministers, and showing them the portrait, asked if any one could tell him the name of the beautiful maiden. But they all shook their heads and stroked their beards. They knew not who she was so displeased was the prince that he sent them away in disgrace to the most remote provinces of his kingdom all the courtiers the generals the officers and every man and woman high and low who lived in the palace came in turn to look at the picture but they all had to confess their ignorance ta kai then called upon the magicians of the kingdom to find out by their art the name of the princess of his dreams but their answers were so widely different that the prince, suspecting their ability, condemned them all to have their noses cut off. The portrait was shown in the outer court of the palace from sunrise till sunset, and exalted travellers came in every day, 
gazed upon the beautiful face and came out again. None could tell who she was. Meanwhile the days were weighing heavily upon the shoulders of Takai, and his sufferings cannot be described. He ate no more, he drank no more, and ended by forgetting which was day and which was night, what was in and what was out, what was left and what was right. He spent his time roaming over the mountains and through the woods crying aloud to the gods to end his life and his sorrow. It was thus one day that he came to the edge of a precipice. The valley below was strewn with rocks, and the thought came to his mind that he had been led to this place to put a term to his misery. He was about to throw himself into the depths below when suddenly the bird Fung flew across the valley and appeared before him, saying, Why is Takai, the mighty prince of Tartary, standing in this place of desolation with a shadow on his brow? Takai replied, the pine tree finds its nourishment where it stands. The tiger can run after the deer in the forests. The eagle can fly over the mountains and the plains. But how can I find the one for whom my heart is thirsting? And he told the bird his story. The Fung, which in reality was a Fung Wong, that is, a female Fung, rejoined. Without the help of the supreme heaven it is not easy to acquire wisdom. But it is a sign of the benevolence of the spiritual beings that I should have come between you in destruction. I can make myself large enough to carry the largest town upon my back, or small enough to pass through the smallest keyhole. And I know all the princesses in all the palaces of the earth. I have taught them the six intonations of my voice, and I am their friend. Therefore show me the picture, O Takai, and I will tell you the name of her whom you saw in your dream. They went to the palace, and when the portrait was shown, the bird became as large as an elephant and exclaimed, Sit on my back, O Takai, and I will carry you to the place of your dream. There you will find her of the transparent face with the drooping eyelids under the crown of dark hair such as you have depicted. For these are the features of Sai Zhan, the daughter of the king of China, and alone can be likened to the full moon rising under a black cloud. At nightfall they were flying over the palace of the king, just above a magnificent garden. And in the garden sat Sai Zhan, singing and playing upon the lute. The Feng Huang deposited the prince outside the wall near a place where bamboos were growing, and showed him how to cut twelve bamboos between the knots to make the flute which is called Pai Xiao, and has a sound sweeter than the evening breeze on the forest stream. And as he blew gently across the pipes, they echoed the sound of the princess's voice so harmoniously that she cried, I hear the distant notes of the song that comes from my own lips, and I can see nothing but the flowers and the trees. It is the melody the heart alone can sing that has suffered sorrow on sorrow, and to which alone the heart can listen that is full of longing. At that moment the wonderful bird, like a fire of many colors, come down from heaven, alighted before the princess dropping at her feet the portrait. She opened her eyes in utter astonishment at the sight of her own image, and when she had read the lines inscribed in the corner, she asked, trembling, Tell me, O Feng Wong, who is he so near but whom I cannot see, that knows the sound of my voice and has never heard me, and can remember my face and has never seen me? Then the bird spoke and told her the story of Takai's dream, adding, I come from him with this message. I brought him here on my wings. For many days he has longed for this hour. Let him now behold the image of his dream and heal the wound in his heart. Swift and overpowering is the rush of the waves on the pebbles of the shore, and like a little pebble felt Sai Zhan when Ta Kai stood before her. The Feng Wong illuminated the garden sumptuously, and a breath of love was stirring the flowers under the stars. It was in the palace of the King of China that were celebrated in the most ancient and magnificent style the nuptials of Sai Zhan and Ta Kai, Prince of Tartary. And this is one of the three hundred and thirty-three stories about the bird Fung, as it is told in the Book of the Ten Thousand Wonders. End of chapter 15 Recording by Philip Gould End of Edmund Dulock's Fairy Tale Book by Edmund Dulock